G'day and welcome to the Campfire Project and a special uh, night for us because this is our 100th uh, panel discussion that we've recorded in this manner. It's also uh, uh, the fourth panel that we've had on Men's uh, Health Week this week. So I've been really uh, looking forward to this. And first of all, as we go into this, I'm going to introduce each of the men here. But first of all, Kenny, I do, would do like to say to uh, Kenny Mamera de Cruz, thanks for putting uh, this thought into my head because I had so many other things going on. The panels may not have happened. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the support. And of course, of that first person I'd like to introduce is Kenny Mamarella de Cruz from London. How are you, Kenny? I'm pretty chuffed to be here at number 100. That's a, that's a milestone, eh? That's really, really something. So good on you, Adam. Um, you. So yeah, my name's Kenny. Um, I can combine something very quickly to introduce myself. Um, since the day that Britain went on lockdown, I've been holding daily men's groups online so people can check in and say what's going on um, rather than lashing out on other people or lashing in on themselves. And a couple of day days, few days before that, um, I went into isolation because a guy who I worked with had the symptoms. And the reason I had the idea is I'm a refugee from Uganda. We lived a few streets away from Idi Amin. And while I was in isolation, I noticed I was listening for gunfire, like I was in the silence between gunfire. And I noticed I kept checking outside to see the military because that's what we had. We had curfew, we were in hiding, we had death threats. So I've had a busy time. Um, and in a way, my whole life and the dramas of my childhood and even adulthood came together and made sense to show up the way I'm showing up and doing what I do during lockdown. It's like, men, are we going through change? And I don't think there's any going back. I think you're pretty right on that one. And then we have uh, Martin uh, Jones. How are you, Martin? Hi, Alan. I'm, uh, I'm well. I'm in Melbourne, so, you know, say no more. <laughs> You've had a lot of <laughs> lockdowns down there. We have, yeah. So, a lot to talk about. Yeah, but I, I mean, since doing a lot of um, shadow work, and uh, since about, I don't know, 2001, which completely changed my, uh, my life, and I guess self-acceptance, and forgiveness i i'm very passionate about working with anyone but especially men um and during this lockdown or the first lockdown i found uh, mentoring men so i became a men's volunteer men's mentor and uh, and then i joined the raise organization which so this morning i was in a, a high school i've got a student to mentor for um oh, till the end of october so uh, a year eight student, which uh, is really exciting. Well, it certainly is, because that's the uh, the age where they're really starting to come into their manhood and having that guidance of your experience and everything else is absolutely magic. That's brilliant. That's yeah. brilliant. And then we have uh, Michael uh, Dehan. How are you, Michael? Really good. And thank you for being a part of the Century Show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never played cricket before, but it's the first time I've been able to <laughs> claim a century. So. <laughs> Yeah, and I suppose a bit of my background, so I'm a behavioural money coach and um, what that means is seeing a lot of men and women go through financial stress, mm -hmm. very much around the behaviour. I think, Kenny, you hit on the head before about when things are happening to you, it, go, it sort of goes back to your childhood, your programming and how that shows up in your life now. And I see a lot of sort of anxiety, a lot of stress mm -hmm. and it's, it's, I'll tell my own story maybe through this episode, but it's, it's just not good for your health and relationships and just trying to empower men to have a healthy relationship with money, um, take away that stress because again, it, it doesn't serve them and it really puts them behind the eight ball in trying to live their best life. Excellent, so true. So one of the things that we've uh, noticed, I know we've had a lot of talk about COVID and everything else, but it has been a major part of our life, but it's been different around different parts of the world. I know the theme in Australia was more around the uh, connecting with community culture, uh, mates, family, and men's groups. But that's mainly been Australia, but the rest of the world has been having a pretty tough time, a tough time with lockdowns. Yeah, you know, Melbourne's copped it badly, but uh, not the rest of Australia, but the rest of the world has copped it a fair bit as well. So, and because uh, Kenny, you put the thought in my mind about making sure we had these panels, 
You were also mm -hmm. on one the other night with um, uh, uh, Scott, and I yeah. thought it'd be really great if you'd lead, it, lead us off tonight, because these uh, discussions always just take their own life. Nothing's ever planned, other than the subject we're going to talk about, but how that subject gets discussed always comes down to what everyone's feeling at the time. So mm -hmm. would you like to start us off, please, Kenny? Sure. And building on what Martin said about the shadows, I think it's been the most incredible opportunity um, in my experience for people to often break down, but also break through. And I've been blown away at the people who've been coming online from all over the world. Um, and there are women's groups and older men's groups, young men's groups, um, and they've been coming in um, being lost, being triggered, being grieved. Some of them have come in and said, I'm feeling suicidal, or my father's just died, or um, all sorts of things. And speaking it out, um, what I've wanted people to do is kind of break the spell of trying to work things out in their heads. Mm -hmm. And I'd say it's very, very male to be straight in the head, don't feel fix it and then there's the tension between the logical and emotional that in my life has gone nowhere um, and as they speak things out the facilitators are trained to not just listen but to open up the question to everyone so we all get to hear from each other's experiences and we can build on that and one of the things that we've all very quickly picked up on is breathe into the feeling of what's going on and it could be, for example, um, I fear for the well-being of my family because I've lost my job and my wife is, I think, going through menopause and I'm just not coping. Um, so it would be quite normal for people to go, oh, my God, we need to fix this Dra trauma, drama. And we do a round on that to see what this might have triggered in people. And more than that, we get people to breathe into it and feel it and then follow the feeling back. And pretty much in a breath, most people go right back to the scene of the crime. It's like the breath or the emotion, that line takes them, it's almost like to the depressed pause button or to the dark shadow that they've uh, run away from or avoided, denied, survived, whatever it is, straight back there. And they've been some icky places from pretty much being tortured by the family and then when losing it locked in the cupboard or being sent to boarding school or whatever, but right back to places that people have forgotten. And just being with that, not just on their own, but witnessed or held or listened to by other people seems to break the spell plus it seems to open the equal and opposite equal and opposite who knows gold shadow of what might be and the most magnificent things in life have opened up so it's set people free it's really set people free um in the uk it's dilly dallying we're on lockdown we're not on lockdown what's going on i don't think we've had the fallout yet that's going to be the next phase but here and now and for whatever happens and i think this so ties in with the, the australian theme it's being with being with ourselves being with our own feelings and being with each other um, so we are collaborating like men rather than competing and surviving like boys brilliant maybe so true so with Martin, with you, the work that you do with the, the shadow work and also the fact that you've, you've been in the lockdown situation there in Melbourne, you're working with uh, kids at school. Can you take us a bit further into this? Um, yes, I mean, thank goodness <laughs> that I, I have done that work because I can handle the emotions that come up in a very different way. So it doesn't mean that we're, we're always, you know, happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a matter of... Um, being able to, yeah, handle whatever comes up it, and have the resources or the skills to be able to, okay, what, you know, what am I feeling? What are my thoughts and actions? Um, and question them. I mean, one of my all time favorite quotes is when I, argue, when I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% of the time. 
Byron Katie because you know we tend to argue with the reality all the time mm. but so then we're in a place of struggle so I think you know we're just then swimming upstream um, so acceptance is yeah is key because you know I'm, I don't like what's going on but I can't change it so I have mm. to have a level of acceptance of what life is like now um, and yeah, there are things, you know, I'd love to do. I'd love to go to Bali and be with my partner. Mm. Um, so, you know, some days I'm, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not happy about that, but mm. I do have that acceptance about it. It is what it is. Um, and yeah, I can probably get an exemption and go there and then choose, choose that option if I want to pay the, the you know, the um, quarantine when I come back and do the two weeks in the hotel. Um, or, you know, speak often on the, on, um, on Zoom or whatever. Uh, so yeah, that's been enormous for me. I think through lockdown, when we first went into lockdown, I was, I was doing a lot of walking. It was, a, I found it a real uh, time to, you know, reassess what was important, as I found a lot of people were doing. But then a lot of people I noticed also were becoming working from home, working in track pants, becoming couch potatoes, not exercising, not eating well. So, you know, and I think we always have, yeah, it's always about choices. Whatever choice we make is, um, is crucial. What we're putting in our mouth or what we're thinking, every choice matters. So, um, yeah. Excellent. That's what that's what helped me or is helping me through. Fantastic. I think you hit it on the head, uh, Mark, when you talk about acceptance. It's, it's a very powerful word, um, yeah. similar to gratitude. So you can either fight it or accept it. And, and when you accept it, you, you bring the power back to yourself. So yeah. there is a lot of people that in a sense of lost their identity to a certain point. And, and they're back in this world where they're home with their kids and the the um, spouse has an example and that they're just so used to their identity where they leave at nine, come back at six, whatever it is, that's their life. And again, that, that just is a powerful word that you just shared with the sad acceptance that that's what is. And then you've got to find a way to breathe into that. And then what do we do about it? Like, how do we, it is a change. It's not mm -hmm. going away. What does a new, new life look like? Like how do we set new boundaries or how do we respect what we've got and, and, still live in that relationship there that is full of love and respect. That's yeah. Very, very well said. Yeah, it very much comes down to how we handle that or how we approach it, I should say, as to um, the results that we get and the impact that that, that has on us, our thoughts, but our, especially our health. Because as you were yeah. saying, uh, Martin, what we think and what we put in our mouth are two vital things, very important. Yeah. Everyone yeah. seems to forget that every thought we have creates a chemical reaction through our body. And so... Mm negative thoughts are going to be chewing away and eating away at our organs, whereas the good thoughts are the things that um, improve our health. Yeah. Hmm. I think one of the other big things for me during COVID was, you know, general well-being because hmm. I am responsible, for, you know, I'm the one responsible for me. No one's coming to save me. Hmm. So I think by eating well, sleeping well, you know, not perfectly, but uh self-care things you know whatever that might be meditation journaling i mean whatever works um but really taking good care of ourselves and being healthy uh in general then if we do happen to uh if we're unfortunate enough to get the virus we can we can fight it off easily mm -hmm. so i think it's it's yeah general well-being is, um is essential for or, I mean, all through our life, but um, mm. but more so now to, I think, to make that, to see what's going on and think, well, I really need to look after myself better mm. if, if you know, if I'm not doing it already. You know, that's definitely something we need to do for ourselves. But when we, we look at, you know, we can look at the things that we should do and some of us are, are doing those things and some are doing it better than others. But there's also a lot of the people who haven't got those skills or haven't even heard of the thought this way. I would expect that uh, with the uh, students, you'd be getting some different uh, sort of uh, responses from all of them. Well, I'm only working with one, 
mm-hmm. um, and he's yeah he's pretty open and uh, very interactive luckily um, so uh, it's probably only been the third week today um, but he said you know said today he didn't he had a goal of running around the local lake or something but he, he's been couldn't be bothered doing it so I suggested that if you ask yourself if you feel like it that most things we won't actually feel like doing Mm. That's something that Debbie Ford taught me a long time ago. So, you know, do I feel like making the bed or doing the shopping, whatever? No. So, you know, just kind of get on and do it. Mm. Um, and I think he, 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 I think he got that. Because if you have a goal, mm. then you don't wait to, you know, to feel like um, doing whatever it is. I also um, feel for, for those that, basically can't afford good food um, and they know very little about healthcare uh, because it's all been survival. Yeah. And um, I wonder with you, Michael, with the work that you've done to do with money, um, I had issues after losing everything in Uganda. You know, we lost everything and we ended up, up here as refugees and we'd never had to shop, cook, clean. We knew nothing about our own self-care or health care and we kind of had to learn it um on zero and as a, a little boy i was uh quite aware especially after my father told me we left him in africa he was on the death list uh you may never see me again you're the head of the family now it's like well what does that mean especially when we land in the uk on a plane where are we going to do where are we going to go what do i do And it's been an impossible situation for so much of my life. Mm. And as soon as I did well in my work, my business and industry, whatever it was, I'd run. I would change my home. I'd change my work. I'd do something because unconsciously they're going to come and get me. So I'd better run. What happens after goodness is the badness. So I'll avoid the badness. Mm. And in the UK, those men who have been the most stuffed up in my experience have been the isolated older men who live alone um, and the isolated younger men who might also live alone. Uh, And if they don't, then they have quite solo existences in their bedrooms in front of their computers Um, and often too depressed to really think about getting out of bed leave alone moving or eating or anything else like that. They've been tough and there have been some who the next day's group has been the thing to keep them going just because there is some connection. Do you come across situations like this, Michael? Yeah, and I mean, there, there's there's a number of things that you brought up there. Um, Kenny and I, I was supposed to share a little bit. Of, you talked about that programming when you're quite young and that naught to seven is quite critical because you can't really analyze what people say to you. And that becomes a part of your program. It, it becomes your subconscious mind in a sense, which runs 95% of your life. Mm-hmm. So I even found myself um, quite successful. I was in a banking career, earning good money. Um, I had a lot of scarcity for children, single mum. We struggled with food. So we'd cook one dinner last a week. Um, father left us when we were quite young and I had worthiness and all those issues there, but it was in my subconscious. And every time I was getting ahead, I would self-sabotage. I would do something there to keep that program. The program's right. Mm-hmm. You don't mess with the program. Yeah. And, and from that, and that's what I was wanted to share with you, that I, I started to become sick. I was always in flight or fight. I was always under mm-hmm. stress. And my body started to become sick. I suffered anxiety, depression, and then, um, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer at a fairly young age. And it was when I really looked at it, I, I was making a lot of money for people. So I knew I, I was very intellectual around making money, but for myself, I didn't think I was worthy of it mm-hmm. subconsciously. So I created my own scenario there where if I didn't change it, I wouldn't be here. I, I was getting sicker and sicker. And I lost my relationship. I lost my marriage. And, and that's when I said something's got to end there. But I... I acknowledge that that was a part of my programming growing up there, that the only one's going to change it. And Mark knew who's on the head before is me. Mm. So I think anyone in any particular situation, um, 
because it brings on a lot of trauma. You've got to deal with those shadows. You've got to deal with the trauma. You've got to find it. <laughs> it's, it's in your body and mind's bloody well hidden. <laughs> so but the, the, the power to actually find that and go, I choose to change. I, I understood that it wasn't even my story. It was a story that was given to me. It was a story that was programmed into me and I had the power to change it. And that's a liberating part. I, I personally believe everyone can change if they understand where they've come from, where that trauma is in their body, which I'd be, Martin, you do a bit of work around that. I'd be really interested. But um, that healing and that self-acceptance and just going, I, I can move forward. What does my life look like? Uh, I want to bring joy. Like people have lost joy. Mm. You know? So, Michael, what was the catalyst for, you, for your change? Uh, my catalyst was that I, I wanted to be on this earth, <laughs> to be frank. <laughs> okay. Um, and and it, it wasn't a major, when I had the prostate cancer, and I, I've said it once and I pretty well got a slap in the face, but I said if I didn't get through the prostate cancer, it wasn't the worst thing in the world because that, that's what is. So I certainly had an acceptance. I didn't want to go, but I, I thought that's, I'm fine with, I'm sort of fine with that. But I, I had two young children and um, I, yeah, I, was, I just thought I had too much to give. Mm. It wasn't my time. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so coming to that realisation for, um, it can be hard and for some people they just don't get there. Yes. And they stay in that broken state and mm. you know, we lose them. And that's the thing is for them to be able to be aware. All these uh, talks that we have, we, we talk about what we've been through, what we've realised. But how do we um, uh, get other people to, or how do we present to other people so they can start looking at things differently in their lives? I think that's, you know, if we are a community and we are working together. It's not just about me. You know, my existence is relied on the people around me, the community and everything else. Because I'm not an island. So if that's the case, how do I step into that role and how do I help those people? Well, I like what? asking people quite simply is whether they believe what they've just said is it true right now because very often um for me for other people it's been an old story yeah. um it's almost like okay that was the question press that button there's the answer it's got nothing to do with me it's not updated might not even feel it um and in conversation it is like getting up to date here and now um, and if there is something stuck, then following it back and being with it um, and very simply in a breath, and it might take a lot of breaths before changing gear, it's letting the man in me get out of my head and into my body and breathe into wherever it is in my body that's stuck. And it might be breathing into the place where my traumatized child is hiding. And if I, as a conscious man, don't connect with him, then he is going to be in limbo with my inner protector, the part that keeps me surviving and attracting what I know to survive. And so it goes on. So uh, people have been shifting in that way a lot. And what people have noticed, what I noticed when I started doing this kind of work um, and the way that I do it beyond conversation is um, an adaptation of voice dialogue where I speak to different parts of people and they move chair or, you know, on the screen. I've been doing a lot on Zoom. So I speak to their protector and I find out a lot more information than the person in front of me. I speak to the man in them. I speak to the trauma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then they're in the centre of all of these voices, of all of these stories, rather than in the trauma and surviving it all. And choice can be made. They learn to adjust, to be present and connected and adjust. And it's magical. It's absolutely magical. The way that the awareness of it, rather than the fear of it, or the automatic pile of, of it can not just set them free, but rather than give me the same old shit, I know how to survive it, kind of distraction as life turns into I'm open to, to some coincidences because the best things in my life have come through coincidence and I haven't actually fixed anything by thinking it through how embarrassing what a waste of time <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, well, when you're thinking you're only using what eighteen percent of your um, your being, whereas logic, but sorry, emotion, we're using eighty-two percent. So why do we use the inferior part to try and fix all these problems by thinking? As I say, how do you change a thought? You don't change it by thinking about it. The only way to do it is to go into the feelings. Mm -hmm. Look and go, well, that's how you're thinking at the moment. How does that make you feel? Well, what's an alternative way? How would you prefer to feel? Now yeah. tell me about what you're doing. Now use all your senses, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, and all the rest and go, describe what you're doing when you're feeling that uh, great way. And you align the thoughts with that. So there's no way of going back to the old thoughts because it's a chasm. You got to go back through their feelings to get back to their old thoughts, and nobody wants to do that. Why don't you go back to those crappy feelings? I feel great right now. Yeah, and I I agree with Kenny. I like to use powerful questions. Uh, you know, is that the absolute truth? Uh, is that your belief mm. that makes people stop and go, what? Uh, uh, yeah, it really makes gives them something to think about. And I think the other thing is being vulnerable and authentic to share in that way you know as the as an example um because that's i mean i used to think vul vulnerability was such a weakness of course um but i now realize it's such a strength mm. so if i can share vulnerably then it just helps other people to you know open up or realize they're not alone with their problems or a particular problem so yeah, I like to, that's really powerful. Yes, I like the fact that when people say that, you know, to show vulnerability is a weakness and then you go, no, it's not, it's a strength. It's everybody who's hiding everything, trying to be the man standing up there and hiding everything is um, not solving their problems. They're feeling worse. And, you know, that's not courage at all. No. Courage is when they actually, uh, Go, right, this is what I'm going through. Mm. Let, me, let, let me talk to somebody. Mm. I think it's still a legacy, Alan, but I mean, I, I still see young kids on the footy field and I see they get knocked down and their dad says, get up, don't cry like a girl. You know, that we still have a long way to go in regard to changing that sort of legacy to our next generation. It's, mm. It might be changing slowly, but as I said, you know, young, young boys or young men are, Shame not to show feelings, you know. Don't cry. Don't mm. don't be vulnerable. It's, it's it's something that will change, but it's a seems like a slow program unless someone else says anything different. Yeah, yeah. I actually. I feel, sorry, go on, Martin. No, I was going to say I acknowledge my student this morning because last time he shared with me, he cried after an argument with his girlfriend. I think they were just texting, but and I uh, I acknowledged him for that. I said, because at his age, I certainly wouldn't have been able to spoke about crying. I wouldn't have spoken about crying. So I said, that's such a great, and that means there's trust, you know, between us, which was great. So, um, yeah, I really wanted to acknowledge him, which I did um, for, a, I thought for a 14 year old, that was very courageous. I feel um, it's an opportunity um, for all of us the way that we're showing up here. Um, I love to show up in the world. And if people are embarrassed by the invitation, um, then that's fine. At least a, a seed is planted, not like I'm some sort of a, you know, on a mission, a missionary mission to get everyone to open up and cry. But if there's something relevant and I think something or feel something rather than being polite or step back, I will say how I feel. And for me, that is normalizing communication from the heart yes. by being it rather than stepping away and talking about it or saying how it should or shouldn't be. Um, what I love about what's been going on recently, um, since lockdown, I wrote an ebook just to pass on the tools. Since turning 50, I, I've no intention to die quickly. I'm far too happy. But <laughs> since turning 50, I just thought I want to pass things on and I've been doing everything I can to pass things on. So I wrote an ebook. I've got a, a training that's uh, just a day training that's accredited for therapists and stuff for people who work with men. And it's really cool online training coming, all of that. But what really brings me alive is the intimacy of people rather than these things. 
um, and I was asked to uh, give a talk in a very posh school um, in London, one of the 30 grand a year type schools full of aristocracy. Um, and then I couldn't because of lockdown. So I sent them something on video. And then there was a, a little gap uh, between lockdowns and the school asked me in to hold their first boys groups. And the boys were, um, you know, it's a posh school. They were mental health and well-being ambassadors, which is cool. <laughs> but to sit in a room with teenage boys who have so much pressure from their lineage, from their parents, education, what's expected, etc., cetera, et cetera, and to really listen to where they're coming from. And more than that, to watch them break the spell and take the invitation and talk about where they're coming from and listen to each other and get blown away that they're not on their own with this. And it's not just let's talk to the younger boys and let's make sure everyone's okay, but there's a different depth to it. That was absolutely amazing. That was like sacred. Um, and as a dream come true, they've asked me back to now train the boys to hold groups so they can pass it on in the school and pass it on in their lives, as well as the staff taking some training as well. So things are changing. Wow. And I think it's up to individuals rather than men or women to open their mouths and break their spells. And what's very tragic for me is the way that parents can put their unfinished business or their um, lacks on the children. Now you do it for me. Now you be the hero boy on the pitch. So I get the good um, pats on the backs from the other parents and they think I'm cool. I failed, I was a dweeb, now you do it for me. Or I succeeded, now you need to carry on the legacy. And you know, it's just ignorance and these things will change. It's just a matter of someone pointing it out and seeing where it goes from there in a loving way. Mm. It definitely, as like I say, it comes down to each one of us to um, you know, decide what we're going to do because we can say that that group over there or they you know, or them have to, you know, should be doing something. But if we want to see change, it always comes back to us, the individual. If we want to see change, well, yeah, we're the ones who got to do it because the other people haven't changed. They aren't even thinking about it. Mm. So it does come down to us to uh, to be the change that we want to see in the world, as they say, by that behaviour. Yeah. To set the example, and then they have a choice. That's it. They, they can follow or not. Yeah. It's just finding the right way to step in and you know start that guidance, especially if you're working with youth, for instance. My oldest boy now is in his um, early 40s. When he was 17 or 18, at the school, they ran a group called uh, Fathers Against Rape. There was a father whose daughter had been raped by male students at one of the schools. His mate said, don't get even. He said, you know, don't get angry about it. Do something about it. So they put together this program where fathers were invited in to go and talk to uh, or listen to the boys talking about, you know, relationships and everything else. And they started out, it was a hypothetical. They'd start out by asking these boys questions. And I was one of the few fathers who went along and I'm standing in the room, but not with my boys. It had to be other kids, not our own sons, because we didn't, they didn't want us influencing them. They asked them a question and then they gave the answer. And I sort of cringed at the, the first answer that was given. And it was all the boys, uh, you know, schoolyard stuff. But then they asked them questions. They said, well, what about this? What about that? And as they guided them, I've always watched these kids through the full period of the, uh, of the session, just get taller and taller. They were really starting to grow because that awareness of just being able to present it to them in a way in which they could think and steer the thinking so they thought about things differently or the answer they gave and said, well, if that's the case, then what would happen in this situation? And they go, oh, that doesn't work. And so they found their solutions themselves, which I thought was a really great way of doing things. Uh, that was 25 years ago. Mm. This is wow. one of the things I'm trying to create. No, I met with a minister that looks after DVAs around financial abuse, but I, a lot of the schooling, what I see around the teachings around money is just very much literacy. Like how to open up bank accounts, budgeting, superannuation. There's nothing around the behavioral side. And I think you hit it on the head, Alan, like 
bring in young people in there, young men especially, and just say, how were you brought up around money? Mm. What, are you, what are your values around money? Mm. Like, what do you see a good relationship? You know, if you're in a relationship with a, with a spouse or with a woman, what, what, what do you think a good relationship means? And getting them to start thinking about it because education is education. There's no real change because it's, there's, it's all external. Mm. There's, there's nothing internal. So um, just trying to work with programs existing to get that behavioural side in because that's my biggest issue. Um, it's about people coming together. They don't talk about money. Mm. It's a taboo subject. Okay. Generally speaking, it's a patriarch system where the male takes on the money role, whether they're good at it or bad at it. Mm. It's just how we're brought up. And, and that just puts so much stress on the relationship. And then there's the fight, someone spending too much, someone, but they never talked about their values. They ne never talked about what their dreams are. They never talked about their own money story, what they've been through. There's, I, I call it financial intimacy in relationships. And I think that'll go a long way for, for mm. men and women to have healthy relationships and a lot more respectful. So they are intimate to begin mm. with. If, if you can have that financial side and have that sort of respected at the same time, it will, it's a major call. Uh, um, money is the leading cause of relationship breakdown in Australia anyway. So it's that's a, it. It's a terrible important. subject. It's yeah. Not, yeah. So true. And I wonder where people go to find out about their relationship to money, or even if people know that they need to find out about their relationship to money. Um, I find younger men uh, go to the internet to find out about everything. And that's quite shocking. It's a little bit tragic. In the old days, it was ask a person. Mm -hmm. Now it's ask a machine. And the machine knows your pains and fears and whatever. So we'll, we'll feed you more of that. We know, we know you like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure how helpful that is. And this includes sex and porn stuff yeah. and God knows everything. Um, and if it's not porn addiction, then people move on to, um, weirdly, YouTube addiction to find out and go down YouTube rabbit holes or um, gaming and God knows what happens to the adrenals or the addiction to those fixes and those extreme mm. secretions that happen. But do you find that people are looking for you or looking for their relationship to money issues, Michael? No, no not at all. Mm. Very much a taboo subject. And that's the issue. Um, I'm starting to work with some corporates who they've got a major problem. 50% of their employees are stressed. Mm. So there's, and we're talking the bottom line here. So corporates are starting to listen. Mm. So it affects productivity. They take more sick days. They're present at work, but they're stressed. And the attrition rate's a lot higher. And there's some proven stats on how that will affect corporates. So trying to bring that in as a part of their overall wellness program, which a lot don't have at this stage, will yeah. be a massive, mm. massive change there. 90% of the clients I deal with are anxious around money. 90% of the clients that would look at porn are anxious around sex. They're, they're trying to work out what to do. So there's, there's this anxiety that's flowing through their body, mm. just trying to work out, as you said, what, what do I do in this life? Mm. I didn't, a lot of times, and it's no one's fault, a lot of times they might have had the best upbringing. So they're just trying to find out themselves and, and they don't know what the right questions. They don't know where to lean to and they're, they're bloody anxious and, and potentially making poor decisions. Yeah, well, they've never been given the guidance from the the uh, their, their, their predecessors because the predecessors got no guidance from their exactly. predecessors. Exactly, mm -hmm. there's no blame. So there's, there's the no blame. Their financial literacy was, as you said, ledgers. That was mm -hmm. a word literacy, but it's it's not it, like everything in school is taught. There's a logic, isn't it? It's about teaching subjects and thinking. There's very little emotional intelligence, and then because we're lacking that, that's where our <laughs> problems are. Yeah. yeah, you have to change our education system, and it's good to hear that. Um, as you said, some of these schools are starting to take a response, both looking at the financial side of things, but also looking at the emotional Emotion, side. Of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean that they're connected. Yeah, you can't have one without the other. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot there. Martin, you're going to say? Well, I was going to say I didn't get any emotional intelligence from my family or my schooling, so you know you're just left to. I guess follow what you know from your your family, your culture, and as I think Michael was saying, you know, zero to seven is when you're, yeah. you're you know, you're, you're 
yeah and your shadows you know your big shadows form your beliefs about yourself mm. so unless we get some um guidance around that yeah we're just going to carry that through life until we until the bag's so heavy we might do something about it or we might not mm. you know when we kind of stooped because the baggage is yeah now, I think the, the language we use or the way we describe things to think people is important as well because you know, we've heard all about the inner child and everything goes, so everyone's going, but I'm an adult, you know, what's this about inner child? But understanding that scientifically that imprinting is done between the age of zero and seven and that, or well, it's a program, it's well and truly you know, set into the machine. Mm. And understanding that side of it, because a lot of it people are talking about comes across a little bit airy fairy for the more technical minded person. And so to be able to explain it in a way in which they understand that and go, oh, that makes sense. And that's what I've had to find with all the work that I do. I've had to come up with both the more spiritual, esoteric uh, direction of the description and something that's very based around the material and scientific world. So I'm talking to a couple and one's one and the other's the other. And then they both come to the same decision at the same time and go, how the hell did that happen? Because being able to find the right language for each one. Mm. Yeah. I try and keep it simple. I've got a mantra that your life is a printout of your subconscious mind. So I don't want people to try and find what's going on in their subconscious mind or where the trauma is. I'm just saying mm. that look at your life. Mm. If you're stuck or if there's something there that you really want to shift, let's start there. Mm. And that's simple terms there. They're going, I am stuck here. I'm not happy here. I want to change that. I can go back and try and find out what, what happened when I was four, but it ain't going to serve me. You know, I, I want to heal myself now. Mm. And I said, there's way to find that in a child, but that's just a real way that people understand it. I used to um, use money and body dysmorphia as my logical vehicles for self-loathing. So if I have a bad feeling, then, and I, I felt a lot safer in trauma. It was not safe to feel safe or free. Um, and those were my vehicles. I wonder how many people use those things. Um, and in the last, well, since lockdown, it's so interesting that when people are held at home, um, either alone or with a partner or with the kids, what comes up that would never have come up. And one of the things that's come up that's blown me away and really opened my eyes has been around relationships and around hormones um, and crazy men. And I would say uh, this is probably the majority uh, are going, oh, my God, how do I stay out of trouble? How do I fix this? I think she's menopausal or I think she's going through. Uh, the perimenopause or you know something to do with or it, it could be her menstrual cycle and it's like yeah typical kind of unaware or fearful bloke mm. you want to fix what's going on naturally <laughs> you're yeah. taking it personally like you did something wrong and now you have to fix it, or you want to stay out of come on so it's been huge for me to start really looking into what all of this means um, Monday was the launch of um, International Men's Health Week. And I, I, like I say, I've, I've trained women. I co-host a, a women's group and it happens to be that that was the day of the women's group. So I brought this up and I was blown away that most of them hadn't had this conversation about their own hormones, the biggest, scariest, most transformative parts of their lives very often um, with themselves or each other or the the women in their lives that they love it's almost like this huge thing sh it should be hush shameful inconvenient um shouldn't it means getting old or something um shocking there is so much and then looking deeper into it and my wife and i love to explore and understand things because you know as ram das said much as I hated him when he said it, we're on the earth and we have to do the curriculum. So here we are with <laughs> physical bodies, what's going on and how do we do this? Uh, and then to find out the misinformation um, around HRT, and apparently there was misinformation that it increases uh, the risk of cancer. So people went off HRT and they, they were put on 
antidepressants for something that's got nothing to do with this. Uh, where has that left them, their bodies, their emotions, us as men, the mm. children? Where has that left the space for them to be, uh, to, to be um, while maybe holding down a job or putting on a good show or not wanting to be judged or not judging themselves, not knowing what they really need and are they allowed to ask for it? Do they even know what they need? So I wonder where you lot are with <laughs> hormones. <laughs> it's Men's Health Week, what else could we talk about? <laughs> Yeah, and we all suffer from them. That's the, the yeah. thing, you know. Yeah, we're all made up of chemicals and the hormones and everything else, they're going to affect us, but our thoughts are going to affect us. But I like the way you were talking, you know, when you said before about these men who are looking at trying to fix everybody else. Now, I love this, the old pointer, one finger pointing and three fingers pointing. Yeah. Like we put so much focus on that yeah. one that we don't have to look at these three. There was a guy who knew who had lost that middle finger down here and... Um, he actually, I talked about this one finger pointing and three fingers pointing back. And he went, yeah, he said, look at this. And there's this missing finger. I said, yes, but I can read between the lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And because that's what we do. We, we try and fix the problems. So this comes back to the fear of vulnerability. When men, I think, feel that it's okay to be vulnerable because that's going to show real strength, it's going to be scary when they do it. But this is the only place they're going to get their solutions then they're more likely to step into that. And then we won't start trying to fix our partners um, at what we think is their problems because it's really our problem. Whatever we're feeling has got nothing to do with anybody else. It's our choice to feel the way we choose, we feel. That's our responsibility, nobody else's. And I think but, we've got this innate thing to fix things, as you pointed out, mm. Ellen, and what they just want to know is that they're heard mm. and they want to cuddle. That's it. And that's, um, and we'd go straight into that fix it later. Oh, what, what am I going to do? Shit, she's going off again, you know. What, I've got to fix this. What, what am I going to do? And that just makes it worse. Mm. It creates yeah, that so. sort of friction there. We're not great at saying she just wants to, like, she's, you know, she's scared. She's going through these changes there. She just wants someone that she loves to be there. We're, 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 yeah. as, as males, I don't know whether we're great at that. I, I put my hand up on learning very quickly that <laughs> but. we go straight to the emotional sorry to the illogical side we want to fix it because we don't want to deal with it you know we are, the problem is we are too emotional but we try and shut it down all the time we don't want to express our emotions because we don't know how to handle it but we are as emotional as, as the women are but then the the thing is that they come along and they're emotional and we go Oops, we can't touch that so we want to try and fix it the difference would be if we just acknowledge where they are to start with I had, did a workshop in Melbourne a couple, back in April and there was a couple there and they got me to profile their child first of all and they came out, they got them coming out the front and I started talking about the difference in their traits and I mentioned to him that uh, when he gets quiet and everything else, he's got things on his mind, how she needs to know what's going on and everything else and that's causing some angst. He said, yes. And I said, well, you've only got one statement to make when you're talking to her. Is this something you want me to fix or do you just want me to listen? And... I said, if she wants you to fix it, either you've uh, screwed up in the first place and therefore she wants you to fix what you've, you've screwed up or you are the fixer and she wants it to be fixed. But more than likely, she's going to ask you to, want, uh, to sit and listen, which means it's got nothing to do with you. I said, do you love your wife? He said, yes. And I said, well, just hold space for her. Just be there for her and realise it's not about you. This is about what she needs to, she needs support. And the look on her face and look on his face, especially when I told her how to actually approach him if she needed to find out what's going on when he withdrew into his cave. And it's finding that connection because in his case, he'd go into his cave, she'd ask him what's going on, what's going on. He's trying to fix whatever it is and disappears further in his cave because we ain't do one thing at a time and that's fix the problem. And uh, so he'd pull away and I said, well, just ask him, first of all, is there anything that I can help you with? Number two, is it anything to do with me? Number, and there's a statement time. Well, I know you need to work on this. I'm going to leave you alone to go and do that, but come and talk to me when you're ready. And the smile on his face. And she went, oh, that's all i got to do. It was just understanding how to talk to the other person. It was so simple, but their traits on their face were telling me that this problem existed. As soon as I mentioned it, yep, that problem existed. Yeah. But we've got that difference in us and that we're just as emotional as the women but the women know how to handle it. That's why they get together and they'll talk to each other and they'll sit in the emotions. They do it far better than we do. 
but we oh. just haven't learned to how to be vulnerable and realize that we're okay if we're around the right people. The more sooner we do that, the better we're going to be. Yeah. I was surprised, Kenny, when you said the women were not talking about their hormones, either with each other or, or really with themselves. That was kind of a, yeah, that was quite was. shocking. Yeah. I yeah. was. Or maybe not at the depth or in the detail. And, you know, this is obviously not all the women, but yeah. I've been speaking with a lot of women about this. Mm. Um, and more often than not, it's, it's somewhere that a lot of them want to deny mm. um, or survive or it's just so overwhelming um, or it might be well brain fog i didn't get it because i've got such bad brain fog or insomnia it's insomnia mm -hmm. maybe i've got insomnia because i'm worried about this or this and this is going on and then they take it to the doctors who'd say this that and the other rather than getting it um and i've heard of a lot of doctors who say to be frank, this is what we do. We don't really know a lot about this. Mm. So good luck to you, mm. which isn't very helpful. Mm. Absolutely shocking. Mm. I had no idea. Mm. Yeah, I would have expected the opposite because yeah, the line is women speak about everything and men don't speak. Mm. Not my experience. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you get men together and you get them in the right environment, as we you know, um, we found in the men's group, yeah, men open up. Mm. I can see the women maybe not talking about as, uh, things as deep as they would um, or they had in the past because of the stigmas and everything else, the attitudes that have been floating around. We look at every, you know, everyone's always doing this pointing. We talk about if something's got to be fixed, or oh, somebody should do this, or they should do that, or someone over there should do it. But it always comes back to if we've got an issue with something, it's up to us to make that change. Nobody else's responsibility but ours, the individual. Yeah. But it's easy and we, to point the finger and blame, isn't it? I mean, it's just mm. projection. I was going to say, I don't know whether you lot have noticed or whether it's true for you, but I certainly have my cycles, uh, minor moon school cycles. Mm. And my wife knows that the week or a few days before the full moon, I can be quite wired. Mm -hmm. um, and then we talk about this in the groups and most months I put on a, what I call men rage. Mm -hmm. And it's about that raw power, that mm -hmm. raw energy that comes up when the moon is brewing that so many men say, actually, yeah, that's when I fight mm -hmm. or that's when I cry or that's when I need to have lots of, rampant sex or something or that's when i drink or that's when i've got a short fuse or that's when i can't sleep but it, it's either going into this energy and harnessing it and directing it or tapping into what's generally been avoided or has broken a spirit by someone else who's in that over powerful energy and have has had power over because so many people av avoid their power like the plague mm -hmm. um and Going back to the money thing, I've very, very often found that people with money issues also have self-worth and stepping into their power issues. And it's not necessarily power over anyone else, but it's being empowered and being able to empower other people. And the tragic thing I have found is when people earn money and they do OK and it gets to a certain stage, and then the money owns them. Mm. Well, it's, I, I deal with clients that will have made money that they'll never spend, and their mindset is that they haven't got enough. Mm. So they hoard. They hoard the money out of fear, out of scarcity. That goes back to that programming. Mm. They can't spend money there because, and even if they've made it themselves, hasn't, hasn't been inherited, they, they still have that hoard mentality. That's... I say that as a very common issue. And that, that's just going back to, you know, what, what legacy do you leave? You know, what, trying to work through some of the issues that are holding them back, how they're brought up around money. Um, if you can release that, then they can do so, so much good in the world. You don't, like, who wants to die rich? <laughs> mm. 
after refugee camps, I was brought up in a very small town in Wales. Um, and I didn't realize until about 10 years ago, it was one of the most impoverished areas in Europe, apparently. I uh, didn't notice that. Mm. I noticed sharing and caring, uh, laughing, um, fishing and sharing the catch with everyone in the street because there were so <laughs> many fish and it was so much fun to catch um, and things like that. And it was magnificent. Mm. Money can't buy that. Mm. And I don't know about over there, but after lockdown here, suddenly it was every person for themselves grab as much toilet roll as you can, take it home and hide it, don't share it, you know, stuff everyone else's bums, it's not our problem. <laughs> and then came the sharing and caring. Mm. But first was the panic reaction. Mm. And then things began to change. And that was wonderful. And I was holding my breath, I was praying to God that this is finally a time where the bubble can be burst and we can be human again. Mm. Community, rather than just second guessing competition, fear based okay. uh, survival. Yeah, because that mm. township you grew up in, the village, and that was, that was a village, that was a community. Mm. That's the connection that we need, you know. Yes, you need you know, money to pay your bills, it's only a tool, it's nothing else. That's all it is. It's a, you know, why don't they go out and trade a chicken for something else? You know, well, that's what you use the money for. But to realize that the most, the wealth that we have is not the financial wealth, it's the, the wealth that we have in our communities and the connections we have with people. Because as you said, Kenny, living in that situation, there's not much there to go around. You're sharing what you've got, but everyone's happy because they're connected to each other. Mm. I, I'm hoping that from COVID with the lockdowns, people are realizing how much they need to be connected. Now, I, I really hate the term socially social distancing because I think that caused a lot of mental issues along the way. It's more physical distancing. But we've had the opportunity to be you know, more socially connected than we ever were before. And that's what's happened with all these panel discussions with the internet, the way we've been connecting. And if we connect on that real level and have real conversations with people, we're not just using the devices to kill our time and just cut away with somebody we're not really connected to but to be able to connect with somebody and really um, get back into having a community and realize our community is not just our local, our local street, our local suburb or whatever, but it's global. Mm. You talk about having world peace, you know, you have the peace within yourself and realize that everybody's got a story, everybody's got a value, regardless of who they are, or where they come from, and you treat them with uh, dignity and respect, they'll treat you back the same way. And a lot of the problems that we're going, I've got to fix this and I've got to fix that, they'll just disappear because there's nothing feeding them anymore. And that's what I say. I say a lot of people, their first thing is, what's in it for me? Mm. So that, that's just greed, ego, and that, that's mm. become more common as, as the years have gone by. And that's, it is unhealthy because it takes mm. away the community. And they said, we really need to get back to that money's energy. So... A community can create its own energy. There's, there's, you know, you look in South America where they've they got villages there that have never seen money. They're mm. fine. Indigenous people, you know, we can learn a lot back. You know, mm. what we believe is the right thing. Um, how to sort of run countries, how to run this world. Maybe it's not so right. Mm. You know, we really need to acknowledge other other ways and and learn and respect some of those other ways as opposed to putting them down. Okay, so as we sort of come to an end and that with this, um, I could ask each of you on that, what sort of thoughts you would like to leave people with who have been listening to this from what we talked about today, other panel discussions or some of the, th just the things that have been happening in your life. We could start with say uh, you, Michael. Yeah, I'd say don't, don't hold it in, like lean into people, lean into friends, lean into people that can help you don't bottle it up because it doesn't serve you I've been through it um, if you can release it and tell your truth and for people not to fix it but people just to listen and there's people out there that will do that so don't hold it in excellent and Martin yeah I think you know don't believe the story of who you think you are um, because it's not the truth 
we just love you know we're meaning making machines so we'd love to make meaning out of every mm -hmm. situation and rarely is it the truth so really to look at ourselves in a much deeper way for more contentment more more joy more happiness brilliant and kenny be the love share the love and give energy to what you want to grow rather than what you want to go okay and after the three of you saying that i'm not saying nothing because i think you've done it beautifully <laughs> <laughs> it are different. we centurions alan Surely we're centurions now. Do we get like outfits or something? Oh, I can see what we can send over to you. I'll get me one of those little caps with the little things up the top there, you know. Exactly. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So thank you. Yeah, this has been really special. It's been special, the conversation I've had with each of you today. It's been special, the fact that, you know, Henny, you've been so involved in this and the, the fact that you guys want to be in the panels. And you've been so uh, supportive of the uh, campfire project so that community spirit is really strong in here and that's because of everybody who's in here so i'm really grateful for that and the fact that this is our uh, 100th um panel discussion wow it's absolutely magic so scott's done about another 33 or so facebook lives but this is the 100th one that was recorded and uh, there's more people stepping up now to do panel discussions and one-on-one -on -one, so I'm able to do what I've always wanted to do, which was get out of the driver's seat and sit in the passenger seat <laughs> and uh, watch what uh, everybody else can achieve. Because I can, I believe that with everybody together, you're going to create a hell of a lot more than I've even had in my thoughts when I started this. Yeah. So awesome. thank you everyone for being here in the group. If everybody else has been in the panel discussions, love to hear from you about the subjects you want to talk about as well. Everybody else, I hope you get a lot out of these uh, discussions that we have. If there's particular subjects that you'd really like to know more about and you'd like the panels to talk about those, send me the uh, the subjects. And if you haven't done a one-on-one -on -one and you'd like to, step into that because once you've done a one-on-one, -on -one, you can come in and join the panels as well. So um, you know, this is your community and thank you everybody for being part of it. So gentlemen, thank you very much for having been here tonight. And to Good everybody to else, you. we'll thank see you on the next yeah. uh, Campfire Project. Thank Bye you, Alan. Thank you for having Bye. us. Yeah. yeah.